welcome to our February work session here at the Borough of Gettysburg. Uh, I do have an announcement this evening. Uh, an executive session of the Borough Council of the Borough of Gettysburg will be conducted immediately following the adjournment of this evening's monthly work session meeting, consistent with Section 708A1 and Section 708A5 of the Sunshine Act for the following purposes. One, to discuss matters involving the employment and terms, conditions, and benefits of employment of borough employees and two, to review and discuss matters of borough business, which, if conducted in public, could lead to the disclosure of information or matters of confidentiality protected by law. Uh, this evening, we're going to start with a uh, special presentation. We're very happy to have Mark Geis here from the Municipal Authority. Um, so if you'd like to use the podium, that would be great, and uh, we'll get the, the slideshow for you. Moving right along. So good evening, Mark Geis, Gettysburg Municipal Authority. Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, was here last year, talked about a couple things, and just um, came back, tried to talk about a couple more projects that we have going on, be able to give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions that uh, might arise, or uh, uh, just um, sit back and understand what the authority has going on right now. So uh, let me see here. What's Arrow to the right or left? To the right. There you go. All righty. So... So one of the first projects, obviously most of the people have probably seen this, it's already in place, is a tank that was constructed out behind the giant on Natural Springs Road. This was a new elevated 1.5 million gallon tank. It went into operation about uh, nine months ago. And um, the existing tank beside it is a standpipe, which will be um, tore down in the near future once the um, cell phone equipment is transferred from the, um, the previous tank to the new existing tank. So this tank um, obviously provides um, elevated storage of 1.5 as I stated and um, obviously also provides a little bit more of um, um, emergency storage for our facilities and for our, our system. So currently between this tank and our current other tanks we have approximately about 2.2 million gallons worth of usable storage right now. That's up from approximately it was only about 1.6 before so um, so that's the that's one of the projects we have going on, so where it's completed for the most part other than demolishing of the existing tanks. So another existing uh, project that we have going on is either the tanks up at the uh, Cemetery Hill site <laughs> off of Baltimore Street, 770, uh, 778 Baltimore Street. Uh, the tank on the left is a standpipe re resemblance of the one that we're going to tear down out at um, Natural Springs Road. Um, our goal here is to um, this summer if everything works out to uh, drain this tank and just rehab it. Um, it's been a f many years since we've done any work to it. So now that we have the 1.5 million gallon tank in operation, that gives us availability to take this tank out of commission for a couple months, tear, uh, basically uh, drain it and then go inside, refurbish it, um, paint it, coat it, and then bring it back into uh, operating conditions. Um, it also, um, the tank to the right is an old uh, storage tank um, that's also um, scheduled to be tore down in the near future also with the uh, raising of the other tank. Um, there's some additional also yard piping that we're looking to upgrade up on the uh, what we call the reservoir site which will include new piping from the tank out through the um, project which will, uh, the Gettysburg Tours will be doing and replacing all the water main through their parking lot and our right of way out to Baltimore Street um, for a future um, take off of there once we um, future for future projects down the road to replace that water main on Baltimore Street existing <coughs> um, eventually also so that's another project that we have in place um, third project that uh, we're looking to um, develop an, an another additional water source. Um, it's a well. It's located uh, south of Gettysburg off of uh, Saks Road. Um, we just recently did some uh, pump testing on it, 72 hour pumping test. Um, the, everything's indicating that the, uh, the aquifer held up good. We're still waiting on quality and um, information like data back like that, but all indications are looking right now that we'll be able to continue and move forward with the development of this well, which will include uh, we, we expect it to be at least a 300 gallon a minute well produced uh, that'll produce like I said uh, 300 which is approximately almost a half a million gallons of water a day it'll also include the extension of a water main starting at the entrance on the uh, Tawnytown Road in front of the uh, visitor center south about a m 
it includes almost about a mile and a half out to the Saks Road. So it's a significant amount of pipe, but um, obviously um, as we keep expanding uh, our sources and stuff like that, obviously we have to keep moving out and um, trying to find additional aquifers that we can tap into. Does this also have, remind me if, uh, if I'm remembering this incorrectly, but the there were some regulatory changes related to how much you can draw off Marsh Creek, is that correct, that well, necessitated we, this? So the um, we have an allocation. You have an allocation permit through the state to withdraw water. Our current allocation permit has expired. Um, we're up for a new allocation permit. We're not sure where that allocation permit's going to go. Obviously, there are restrictions and uh, limitations to um, withdrawals, and then they're trying to meet past five flows also. So currently, during low flow. Um, stream flows during typically the summer months we have to pass by 6.68 .6 cubic feet per second which is basically 50 gallons and that's what is required so when we drop below that flow we're only allowed to withdraw um, the amount of water that we can introduce to the stream through what we call stream well so it's only about that, that equals about 900,000 gallons a day so our plan is typically um, producing one and a half can produce one and a half two million gallons a day if if needed we typically don't but has the uh, capability in the permitting process to do that but in the summertime we are reduced so with that being said um, obviously another source like this will add to our um, to our capacity ability and hopefully um, fingers crossed that the state um, we, we're allowed to keep our existing um, allocation and, and keep the, the current flow by pass by if it reduces a little bit we might be um, uh, restricted to uh, withdrawing water in this um, from Marsh Creek maybe in the summertime we're not sure so that's still to be determined so So um, another project which is uh, going to be taking place in town is the um, phase two interceptor replacement. That's um, it's a sewer project. Um, a few years back, phase one consisted of renewing the sewer main from the sewer treatment plant out around, um, kind of out around the, the um, north side of town, down behind Dowtow, um, across Water Street, um, or yeah, up, up to Water Street and Stratton Street. Um, this project is going to take from that position and renew the, the sewer line along Water Street, across Carlisle Street to Washington Street, um, and then uh, basically traverse and kind of travel along Stevens Run, um, go underneath the railroad tracks, come into the cul-de-sac at Franklin Street, work its way over to uh, Racehorse Alley, and progress down Racehorse Alley. Um, getting ourselves over into front of Federal Point and then eventually down Brame Alley to West Middle Street where the project will end. So um, it's close to being um, permitted. Um, the design is pretty well complete. Um, we've um, worked on getting our right-of-ways from um, the uh, private partners um, in the area and one of the last things that we're working on is we're working with the borough and the Gettysburg uh, Stormwater Authority regarding um, we have some tight um, maneuvering to do in the Brame Alley area where not only there's existing infrastructure but we'll be looking to put our new sewer main in there be to the fact that the existing sewer main is on the other side of Stevens Run and it traverses underneath um, the edge of that brick house some of you know is the Toga's house and it also advances up and almost uh, and also uh, travels very near the uh, foundation of um, Miss Heather Hazel's house which is sits at the corner of uh, the Braham Alley and Middle Street right across from Foursquare Gospel so we'll be able to uh, eliminate the um, sewer from traversing close to those properties and get it in a in a more public uh, right away obviously will, will that tie into the pump house in it does not actually that that pump house that currently sits at the uh, Reynolds Avenue is kind of a transfer station that still takes flows we're not sure how much it'll be needed being that the pipe will be upsized in this new <coughs> interceptor convey more water um, down around to the sewer treatment plant but that pump station that sits there on Reynolds Avenue basically works if the flows get too high it actually pumps and pumps the water actually oh, sure. over this way and brings it into a different interceptor line that flows into the treatment plant from the um, from what we call the um, Culp's Run area. So, so I do believe we'll still need the pump station. We're not sure how much will it'll uh, be used, but 
um, with the current, um, obviously, I and I infiltration and inflow in the source system in Gettysburg and stuff like that, aging infrastructure, we still have, obviously, um, a lot of um, issues with um, high flows during rain events. So I, I would imagine it'll still be, still be needed. Another project that we're working on is um, we currently pur recently purchased the property at 424 uh, East Middle Street, um, kind of adjacent from the uh, highway shed. Um, this is a rendition. It's the uh, it's a flat roof brick story building now where the um, health center used to be. Uh, we're hoping to uh, renovate it. This is a rendition, hoping to. Uh, Pretty much have it look like that put a new roof line on it and um, put it out for uh, renovation here sometime this summer and hopefully move our um, administrative office up to there which will help get them out of the floodplain <coughs> and provide additional um, office space for um, for growth and personnel into the future so looking forward to uh, to this project also Uh, some other future projects. I just one is uh, we're also working with a collaboration between the uh, the borough and Columbia Gas on a um, what we would be looking to do is some water and sewer infrastructure on the area of East Lincoln Avenue um, up to about Carlisle Street from Fourth Street to Carlisle Street. That's um, a project that's in the future and would be um, hopefully uh, slated for 2025. Um, also, um, one of the things um, obviously just working with uh, borough staff. And the engineers and everything obviously you know, the boroughs um, one of your big projects is to uh, work on the Baltimore Street corridor and obviously that's a big um, big project but a lot of aging infrastructure obviously being that was one of the major thoroughfares obviously and probably one of the first streets to probably have public water and sewer so obviously I'm um, trying to work and just trying to uh, work with staff as you progress in your program and know what you um, are looking to do trying to make sure we communicate and stay in um, to stay in communication so we can work to try to facilitate and get the funding that we possibly would need also to uh, hopefully work together that once that project's done all utilities in that thoroughfare are uh, new and usable for the foreseeable future so it's um, that the uh, that, that we minimal impact would be after that fact so which as it's it's that's a large under uh, undertaking, but um, I think it'd be very important for uh, once that street is completed and your new corridor developed, that the uh, any utilities that can be obviously replaced and or renewed would be uh, done. Uh, that's all I have right now. Um, obviously, any questions that uh, you guys might have for me, obviously, please um, I'll try to answer them. Obviously, also as I stated here. I was here the other year. If anyone's ever interested in doing a tour of the facilities, I know Judy, Matt, you guys have both spoke. Obviously, reach out to me, and we can always set something up. That probably, uh, depending if you want to do water sewer or both, obviously it would um, it would entail uh, maybe um, one or two different um, meetings because by the time you get to the water plant, and take a tour of the sewer plant, it probably takes a couple hours, and or takes and take you to a couple well houses or a couple. Uh, pump stations it'll chew up some time of your time so but anyone's always welcome to uh, come along and water and sewer 101 okay. so um, obviously uh, thanks for inviting me again and um, does anybody have any questions for uh, for me at, at the current yeah. time I, I had awesome. a question mark sure. um, you said the one tank is going to be demolished yes um, did you mention where the, the um, you said it will be drained obviously before where does that go did you mention well, so the tanks are both those tanks that are going to be torn down are already drained. Oh, they're drained. Okay. Yeah, so I typically we use the water down as far as we can, and then okay. unfortunately, since they're stand pipes, you just have to um, drain it out a waistline. So you just dechlorinate it and um, and let it slowly percolate back into the storm sewer and stuff okay. like that. So, because we have a presentation by the garden club tonight, I thought maybe you could share that water with them. You know, yeah. if they <laughs> throw it away. Million gallons. <laughs> that would go a long yeah. distance. So. Anything else? All right. Thank you. I'll think so. Thank you so much for coming. It's well, always great to keep I mean, connected. I, I know you guys are busy. You have a lot on your slate, but um, obviously, always feel free to reach out to me. I'll try to answer any type of question I can for you guys. So, very thank good. you very much. Very good. Thank you.
<coughs> All right, and we uh, also have a presentation by the Garden Club, uh, Ms. Daniels. Thank you for letting me come and speak to you today about our lovely club. Um, I wanted to introduce Karen Zoke, who's with me. She is the driving force behind the spree with the club, and I'm going to talk to you about how successful she's been. So as a little bit of background, I think you all remember the borough started the process of the downtown flower project, had to let go of it for budget reasons. It went from entity to entity to entity, and in 2008, the Garden Club decided they would take it on. We've struggled a lot. In 2008, um, every year, it was like, are we going to be able to do this or not? It's an expensive project. It's closing in on about $10,000 a year now. And um, it became something that we wanted to have very much. Our gour gourmet green sale and our plant sale supported it. We went and talked to people to please donate. We did everything we could to keep it going. And then the spree started in 2013. The club strategically made the decision that we would be awareness campaign to this community who love those flowers. If you donate to the Gettysburg Garden Club, it equals you've donated to the Downtown Flower Project. When that started, we created an entirely restricted fund within our budget, within our, our checking, we even has its own account. All the monies that come in from the spree are dedicated solely to the Downtown Flower Project. Over the last nine years, the community has been very generous. And in the last couple of years, we feel we're finally solvent that we can support this from the spree if it stays like it is now. If it goes up, even better. We actually had a little bit of some surplus this last year. If you remember, we had that push that said, if you get 5000 in your forever fund, we'll give you 5000 So now we are actually having two different funds within our restricted, two kinds of sources of revenue. The one that we're using the nomenclature of the spree we're having our everyday funds that gets us from year to year to year. And we have our funds that we are now putting back into the foundation of the spree. That is like this far in terms of getting going. Our goal then ultimately is that this downtown flower project will be self-supporting. So this will probably take decades, but <coughs> how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So we are going to start, and our goal is that this, these flowers will be here forever, long after I'm not a member of the club anymore. <laughs> yeah, so the, what we do for the Downtown Flower Project, the, the cost is part of what we're discussing here is the memorandum. That's the cost for the water every year. We also every year buy plants and potting soil for 48 baskets and eight planters. And those baskets are huge. We also have to have funds that we put aside all the time for our not every year ones, but every three years we have to replace all of the, the um, liners in the baskets. And every 15 to 20 years you have to replace all the baskets because they wear out. Two years ago we actually had one pole that didn't have a basket, you probably didn't notice, because we had all our spares and <coughs> others that had just, they just corrode. And we took a really good look at the baskets. They were in very poor condition. And last year, we bought 50 baskets. And we were able to do that with the funds from the spree. So the spree has just really made this project. And we wanted you to know that we take it very seriously. And those are restricted funds. Anything that goes into the spree goes to the Downtown Flower Project. Okay. Now, we have two other major sources. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what else we do. Um, I said I talked about the plant sale and our, uh, our greens and gourmet sale that we have every year that uh, we have been very successful with. Um, a lot of that success has supported the downtown fl flower project. But now we kind of have some funds, right? So that you know what we're doing um, 
have been doing and will continue to do and more of what we're going to do. We donate back to the community every year. We donate to Land Conservancy of Adams County, the Watershed Alliance, Gettysburg Green Gathering, Strawberry Hill Foundation. We also uh, contribute to a National, Gar uh, National Garden Federation Club uh, program called Penny Pines. And that every time you give them $68, they plant a tree in a national forest. So we give that to that as well. If we continue, if we need to continue to support the downtown flower project, if you know the economy happens happens to that and the spree doesn't come through as much, our general funds will still help support the downtown flower project. But we're feeling comfortable, like I said. We're going to start a new project this year and have started it. We are now collaborating with the Habitat for Humanity of Adams County. And for the 17325 Ketchman area, Hunterstown, Cashtown, Ortano, and Fairfield, not Biglerville or Littlestown because those two have their own garden clubs and we don't want to step on our sister's toes. But for those areas that are within our Ketchman area of our club, we will now provide the initial um, front of the yard landscaping for the Habitat for Humanity houses. So for example, we have our first house we're going to do in June, and for each side of the front of her home, from the front door to the side of the house, about five feet away from the house, we're gonna plant a garden for her to get her started. Uh, part of the Habitat for Humanity um, contract is that they have to lay grass seed, but that's it. So we're hoping to help these homeowners to uh, begin their landscaping process. Uh, we'll teach them how to dig, how to plant. We'll give them uh, information on how to maintain them. But we'll buy the plants. We'll help design with them, make them a nice design so they can start out with some curb appeal. And we're excited to be looking forward on that. We're also extremely active and have been in the past and will continue to be active with Gettysburg Green Gathering. We're uh, very close partners with them. The uh, Butterfly Garden and the Rec Park you know, Steve Zimmerman dug it all up, got the plants, and the garden club planted them all and put all the mulch in. So we worked like that. We did the same thing with the Mercy House. Uh, the garden club members are the ones who actually trimmed the trees at the YWCA with Steve. So we work very closely with him, and we will continue to do that. The, um, what else we're thinking about in the future is we want to do a little bit more with our youth. Um, we have just beginning this. We haven't really formulated everything we want. Last summer, we went to the farmer's market for the first year. That is part of our awareness campaign for our spree and our garden club. We uh, have a booth. We let people know who we are, and we give them little postcards that say, don't forget the spree and don't forget the sale. At that um, time, we put together a whole bunch of little red bud seedlings with instructions on how to take care of them. And with parental approval, we gave them out to all the children. They were, oh yeah, I got a tree. They loved it. So we're going to continue to do that. Uh, one of the things we're thinking about is, just, is um, working with our library about putting up posters in the children's areas about how, how important pollinators are or, or how easy it is to plant with seeds and then leave a basket of seeds. So we're going to start doing some things like that as well. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with the club. I have one thing that I don't know if it got passed out. Um, on April 27th, um, we are having a gentleman named Matt Rader. He is the president of the Philadelphia Horticultural Society, and he is going to come to speak with us at the firehouse at 1 o'clock. I invite all of you to come and hear him speak. I read in the paper, and it's common knowledge here, uh, Mark spoke about it too, that you're doing a project to look at downtown to see what you can do to redesign it, go down ba the Baltimore Street. This gentleman, their horticultural society, has done over 250 programs and gr on the grounds changes to the uh, neighborhoods of Philadelphia and talks about what they do, how they do it, what you could do, and he's going to come and present to us. I invite you to join. You might get some ideas for your contractor. Any questions? Any questions? I have a Go ahead, Julia. Yeah. This is Butterfield. Yes. Um, two things uh, I walked in with Marianne, and two things she did not brag about, but I think <laughs> they should be mentioned. 
Number one, they found a farmer for the baskets that had worn out who takes the baskets and repurposes them. Right. Um, so, so they're not in landfill. <laughs> yes. And the other point is the MOU, as you saw, addresses um, the baskets in town, the planters in town. But the circle is done by the garden club. They correct. purchase yes. those uh, plants. And That's correct. The yep. lovely circle. Right. The, the circle we take out of our general funds, that the money that we make from our gra our green sale and our plant sale, that funds the, the flowers in the circle. Yep. Okay. Sure. Uh, just a question. Do you ever partner, does the Garden Club ever partner with, um, you mentioned youth, do they ever partner with any of the Girl Scouts in the area? Because I believe that there is a specific patch for them. There's, oh, is there? There may even be a patch for the Boy Scouts as well. And when you mentioned going to the Habitat for Humanity and helping them start, right. I think they would absolutely love, I know some Girl Scouts, would absolutely love to learn just as you're, and help you, and just help as us. you're teaching that resident. That is an awesome um, idea, yes. And I always see all out on the, you know, working on the square, and I think that that could be another opportunity mm -hmm. for some, with I their would, parents. With I would say I'd be nervous yeah. about them being on the square. There's a reason we wear bright pink <clears throat> shirts. Right. It's so that the semis don't, knock right. us over and you can be weeding on that square yeah. and all of a sudden you look up and see a wheel yeah. i would be a little nervous about young children in the middle of that square um, but i think working with the girl scouts and the boy scouts is an excellent suggestion and we could as i said we're very at the beginning of what we could do with youth yeah. and that's wonderful thank I, you I, I think that would be a, a great an additional great way mm -hmm. for um more folks in the community to uh, become it more involved with your giving spree yes. project. Yes. Because the more that you get the youth involved and their parents right. involved, right. Yep. the better. Yeah. Um, that would be that would be wonderful. Yep. But you do great work. So thank you so thank much you. for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the, just to echo my, my colleague just said, the um, the square and the baskets and yes. they always look fabulous in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. And this year, I don't know how long you've been doing it, but I noticed at the holiday time during yes. the festival, those planters look right. gorgeous. Oh, yeah. I mean, you really did a lot of greenery. We started and some that things. three years ago, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that actually the Garden Club itself funds. It doesn't go into those okay. restricted funds. We started putting in a winter display, we yep. call it. Yep. We put it in just before Thanksgiving. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, this Monday, they're all coming out. Okay. And what's going back in are pansies. Okay. And the Garden Club uh, supports that too, buys the pansies until the uh, summer uh, flowers go in. Well, it was noticed. I had visitors Good. from out of yeah. town. And Excellent. Really Excellent. thought it was lovely. Excellent. So, and yes. I Especially yeah. this, this this past year. You say you've been doing it for those corners in the wintertime. Yes, years. we this have. This one with the... With the the long, yes. I mean, it looked like a scene out of Frozen. It was and the great. genius <laughs> right, is right there who I loved designed it. that. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can tell yeah. we really appreciate Karen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, this brings us to our public comment segment. It is for items that are on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Gable has those items there on the screen uh, if you have any question to that. Uh, but we ask that you uh, give your name, your address, and limit yourself <laughs> to five minutes. Uh, we do have a separate comment, public comment period at the end where you can address anything on or off the agenda. Any public comment? <coughs> All right, if not, we're going to go then to the uh, Memorandum of Understanding uh, with the Garden Club. Yeah, so staff met with... Um, <coughs> Ms. Daniels um, about two weeks ago and we, we went over the uh, memorandum of understanding. The, the old one did expire uh, in December of last year so we wanted to get a new one in place. There's really one major revision so from the perspective of services provided by the borough and the services provided by the Garden Club there really are no, no alterations there. The biggest alteration is the financial arrangement um, the practice had been, and I've, I've always thought it was a little clunky, if you will, um, where the garden club was required to place a deposit with the borough, and then we would keep track of uh, staffing expenses, and then we would settle up any differences at the end of the, uh, the growing season. Um, obviously, the garden club has been a really good partner with the borough. So I, I thought, let's try to find a way to streamline that process. 
And knowing the hard work they do with raising funds, I thought, let's try to preserve some kind of not only sustainability, but certainty for their budgetary purposes. So this year, um, the borough uh, invoiced the Garden Club for just under uh, $4,800. And that, so that was what was ultimately paid to the borough from the Garden Club. And that essentially paid Public Works Department staff to take care of the flowers watering uh, every day. Um, so I wrote this draft uh, with the concept of we will continue to invoice them at the end of the season, so there's no deposit. We'll just settle up at the end of the season, and we have a cap. So we have a number that will not be exceeded. Right. And, and frankly, if the number is exceeded, the borough benefits so much from that, and I think that was, <coughs> that's something that's, the borough yeah. could, could, could handle. So that's the big change in this MOU. And so uh, with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions, and I'm sure Ms. Daniels could, could respond as well. So this would appear on our uh, March agenda for the meeting then for adoption. I mean, I don't think our, I think it's fair to say that the downtown flower basket program wouldn't exist without the Garden Club. That's so, absolutely correct. I mean, I, I really appreciate that everything that you do and I, I appreciate Charles thinking about how we can try to make this a little bit easier in terms of administration with the club. I don't want to burden them any way that's unnecessary. They do so much fantastic work for the, the town and, and the tourists really uh, notice it and I think that the locals do too. Any questions? Okay, so I think we can send that forward to March then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, that takes us to Mr. Clayball, the inner loop racehorse alley discussion which I think is I've been expecting this conversation for about eight years so <laughs> I remember Tom Jolin coming to my house <laughs> well, the feasibility study was in, done in 2010 so we're on 13 years when okay we when he started talking to me about it in 15 it was like so you've won this primary election let's talk about racehorse alley <laughs> no it wasn't the only thing you talked about <laughs> so we're going to wrap it all up now in 10 minutes? Is that what yeah, that's how, it's, that's how this works. Uh, we'll have a 10-minute conversation now. Um, this will be the first bite of many, I think, Chad would yes, tell you. Yes, yes. And that's exactly how I intended to initiate the discussion here tonight. But most all of you know me, but for those of you at home might be watching, I'm Chad Clayball. I'm a civil engineer with C.S. Davidson. I've been the borough's engineer for over 10 years now and helping you with uh, bike and trail design. So. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about Racehorse <coughs> Alley and whether or not to make it one way. Um, there were some discussions and suggestions in our feasibility study and our master planning process that suggests that it would be a good idea to make this one way if we're going to really designate this as a pedestrian bicycle path. Um, but before we dive into the specifics of the, of the presentation, just to give you a real high level of where we stand, uh, the master planning process identified three phases, A, B, and C. A has been constructed, it got finished about five years ago. Uh, we're currently under uh, contract to, to do the design of phase B, uh, largely thanks to a lot of different grants that the Healthy Adams Bicycle Pedestrian Incorporated was able to pull together, uh, one being a, a C2P2 grant through DCNR. Uh, we started that about <coughs> a year ago, um, and we're making good headway, headway with, the, with the design. A lot of the utility stuff is one of the first things you, you, you tackle whenever you're doing the design. We have our DEP permit for our stream discharge. Uh, we have submitted our, C, um, our railroad permit. And um, the next step really is to identify this alley to see if we want to make it one way. Um, the, what I expect out of this meeting tonight is just to get you guys started to think about this one way. I don't expect that we're going to leave this meeting with everybody in favor of, the, of this this option in fact there's still going to be many more questions than answers at the end of this meeting is what i expect uh, what i'm hoping is that within the next four to six months that we have that decision made uh, we're looking to have this thing shovel ready by the end of this year uh, there is uh, we are looking to use some cdbg money to start constructing this thing the first round of cdbg money needs to be spent by the end of 2024 next year so that's why we're kind of pushing to get the, the design finished by the end of this year. 
we can't finish the design until this decision's made. So I'm looking at like midsummer. Hopefully, we can have a decision here. If you guys are like all on board with one of the one of the options today, great. But I don't expect that. You know, so we can keep this um, discussion high level today, um, interactive. If you, if you if as I'm going through this, you see something <coughs> that you want to question me, just stop me, and we'll we'll start talking it through. So. Um, when we're talking about um, doing a, a, an alley one way, the first thing we need to do is we need to bring in a traffic consultant. We need to understand what some of the variables are and eliminate some of those variables if, if we have a chance. So um, that's what we did. We brought in uh, Michael Baker Incorporated. Um, they did a traffic analysis on, on our corridor. Um, they assessed the traffic impacts and the feasibility of converting the alley from two-way to one-way. Um, and this is going to help us inform our decision. So one of the, they looked at, f at five intersections here, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and this is the alley right here that we're talking about. These three along the bottom are signalized intersections. The two at the top are not signalized intersections. Although these two at the top are going to be the ones that are most impacted by this discussion. Um, just to get your bearings, this is North Washington Street. This is Route 30 here. Try not to poke Charles with my laser as I do this. Um, so uh, the first thing to do with the traffic analysis is do traffic counts. So you put the counters out there, and this is the counts. And I know it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, there's, there's kind of a couple of important pieces to this slide. Um, first, the bullets, the intersection turning movement counts conducted at the highlighted locations. Again, here, here, and here are the three of the highlighted points. Uh, most vehicles entered and exited Racehorse Alley via Washington Street. That's going to be an important piece of this puzzle. That intersection right there is where most of the people come in, which makes sense because there's commercial, commercial traffic over here. There's a bank. Um, Gaysburg College uses this intersection. So a lot of what we were finding from their analysis is exactly what we were expecting. Uh, third bullet, few vehicles observed entering and exiting along Franklin Street. This just had a few vehicles, 10, 20 vehicles which isn't much at all, out on Route 30, which has 10,000 vehicles. And this is in a 24-hour um, period. And then there was uh, the fourth bullet there is that there was a significant amount of pedestrian bicycle activity observed during the field visits. Um, so we want to promote that. We want to make more of that. Um, but it's already being significantly used. I wanted to add one other thing. I didn't put a bullet on there for this, but uh, the other major traffic characteristic is that that alley is only about 12 feet wide in a lot of places and you can't pass two cars so essentially there's a sea of pavement at some locations that's outside of the existing right-of-way and the people just drive out on the private property to pass each other and that's a pretty common occurrence it, that happens pretty much all day every day with the alley The next thing that traffic engineers look at is the, the safety data, uh, the crashes. Uh, was there a significant amount of crashes that's going to impact our, our design at all? Uh, the sim simple answer to that uh, is no. There was no existing crash trends that's going to cause further issues if we convert this thing to one way. Um, you can see there was, there was <coughs> this is in a five-year period, there was some crashes, but, uh, you know, not that many. A couple. Um, the most notable one here that I, that I jumped out at me was that there was eight crashes of people that are hitting fixed objects, telephone poles, those kind of things. So there really wasn't that many accidents. I'm going to jump ahead to one other slide here, and I'm going to talk about some recommendations. So before we start getting into the options of making this thing one way, um, I think we need to consider what are, what's the goals, what's the objective here? Uh, and I first want to read two different blurbs from the master plan that we worked with the council on back in 2013. Uh, we said, Racehorse Alley, changing Racehorse Alley to one way would make it safer and more accommodating for bicycle pedestrian use. We also said, at the present time, asphalt parking areas joins most, much of the asphalt alley with little or no distinction between public right-of-way and adjacent paved areas. The existing cut through motor vehicle traffic utilizes both in indiscriminately. That's what I, just, what I just described to you. In phase B2, we said changing Racehorse Alley between 
Washington Street and Franklin Street to one way would make it safer and more accommodating to pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Another option is to further improve safety of pedestrian bicycle traffic to make this section one way westbound. With this option, vehicle traffic on both blocks, Racehorse Alley will turn south onto Franklin Street, we're dubbing this the Franklin Street Funnel, which would which after one block intersects with Chambersburg Street at the signalized intersection. The effect would discourage cut through traffic while still allowing motor vehicle access to the rear of all properties. So there was a suggestion made in the old master plan that the council approved back in 2013 that, that we start looking at this one way considerations. Um, this is a master plan that was done. So that's just a planning process. Ultimately what will take is an ordinance and uh, the council will have to make a decision um, to, to if they want to make this this alley one way um, so uh, I, you can see on the on the this slide here there's some of those same goals and objections or uh, objectives I'm looking at item number one and four here those are kind of similar if you reduce the cut through traffic you also appeal to bicycle pedestrians the other two are kind of the opposite of that is your goal to minimize the impact of Route 30 and um, provide land use accessibility? Those would kind of be um, opposite of, of making or of reducing the, the through traffic. So you got to kind of think about what the objectives are. At the end of the day, we would like to try to um, reach to all of those objectives. If we can reduce the amount of cut through traffic whilst with still making sense out of land use accessibility, and not impacting Route 30, that would be a perfect scenario. And I'm going to come back through some of the options. There's, there's essentially still a, a, maybe a dozen different options. Um, I'm going to get into some PDFs later in the discussion on some of those, those options, but they really boil down to, to, to three scenarios. One way west to east, one way east to west or what we're going to call a Franklin funnel. Um, this first slide talks about the eastbound one way conversion. What you're going to see in every single slide with the traffic engineers found is that there's very little change in capacity control delay at all the study intersections. It's basically the same thing through all three of these slides. Uh, that's good news. That takes that variable off. We're not going to have to go to PennDOT to get new permits, new um, timing change to any of the traffic signal, those kind of things. Um, this option going eastbound um, does redistribute more traffic on to Route 30 compared to the westbound direction, mostly because uh, most of the vehicles that we see on the alley are going westbound in the afternoon. And whenever the county did the analysis back when we did the master plan, we found that in the morning most of the cars go east because they're coming into town trying to get to the college, and in the afternoon most of the cars are going west. They're trying to bypass the, uh, the traffic signals. Uh, so this one does put a little bit more of the cars on Route 30, uh, but still not enough to change the, the capacity or control delay. Um, and this option, I also pointed out here that this option would match the Racehorse Alley directional traffic um, going east. So currently, Racehorse Alley is only one way the next block east of this. Uh, keep in mind, if you go just north of that alley, you have Railroad Street, which is one way west. So there's still an option that people can bypass these traffic signals either with the alley or Railroad Street uh, one way or the other. So that kind of takes that variable off the table a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about a lot is this last bullet right here is greater queuing issues could arise along the southbound approach at US 30 and Washington Street. So the Washington Street intersection is going to be the one that's going to be impacted the most if we make this thing one alley, especially if you're coming south on Washington Street and you're sitting at that traffic signal. It doesn't take too long for that to, the queue to start stacking. The queue is a fancy traffic word for stack traffic All right so if you're sitting there at that traffic signal um, and you're in queue there's only about four or five cars before you're stacked up past that next alley um, so that's something to keep in mind as we we think through some of the options here one way uh, west i'm not going to get into all of the specific here because it's a lot of the same things um, 
again, point out the fact that it's very little change in capacity control delay, slightly more at the Buford intersection. Obviously, if we're going west and everybody's going to have to go out to Buford instead of water, or Washington Street. Um, There's a bullet here I wanted to point out to you, the concern involving residents along Racehorse Alley, particularly those at the Creekside Apartments. So if you did one way east, it works better with the Creekside Apartments. One way west doesn't work with Creekside Apartments too much. One of the options is to still have two-way traffic in and out of the Creekside, Creekside Apartments. If that was one way east, anybody that wanted to get through could continue on their merry way. But if it's one bait way west and they started in there and they didn't want to go to Creekside Apartments, now they're stuck. Now they're having to do a turnaround in the Creekside Apartments. So that's something to keep in mind too with the westbound one way conversion. And the same thing with the queuing analysis at, at the Washington Street intersection. And then there's the Franklin Street funnel option. Uh, while both the one way west to east and one way east to west would allow all of the cars to fit within the 12 foot right of way you're still going to have a significant amount of bypass traffic either in the morning or the afternoon this option would eliminate the most pass through traffic this one would be make it the most safe for bicycles and pedestrians so if that's the goal this is the best option. Again, if the goal is to change, have the less impact on Route 30, then this isn't the best option because this is going to have the most impact of Route 30. Again, very little change. This is coming directly from the traffic engineers, but this one would have the most of the three options um, to, the, to the impact of Route 30. When we say eliminate pass-through traffic, it might not <coughs> completely eliminate um, Pass through traffic, and I'm going to come back to that later because there is a chance that um, some people still could bypass the Washington Street intersection with this option. And the other thing with the Franklin funnel is it could go both ways. So I was using the words um, centrifuge as the other p potential scenario. So this one has both alleys coming in and then funneling <coughs> down and out of Franklin Street. You could also go the other way up and out, like a centrifuge, and go and out. Um, that actually the centrifuge idea would be the most restrictive to through traffic and that would be the most um, um, bicycle and pedestrian safe um, but that does have some other issues like I said earlier if you're going wet, one way west at Creekside Apartments that kind of hinders our option of making that two way and if you're going one way east over here I'm not sure if that's going to be what the college is going to be interested in uh, or and it's also going to have a significant impact to that Washington Street um, queuing issue that I have. Uh, so I'm not sure that the centrifuge is the best idea, but keep that in mind. You could go both ways. It could be a funnel out front, Franklin, or a funnel in and, and then out of the alley. Do you want, yes. do you want questions yeah, now? Go, yep, Jeff? absolutely. Go ahead. I'm just thinking that funnel that you just talked about, if, if that, that would put a lot more traffic on Franklin Street then. And right now there's parking, it looks like, on both sides of Franklin. So I don't know whether or not, and, and there's not a lot of room for passing in that area. Would that, did, did the feasibility study look at uh, eliminating parking on, on one side or the other of it, it didn't, Franklin? Um, and it's because there's still plenty of room and we're not talking about a huge amount of traffic. Okay. Um, they weren't thinking that the amount of cars that it's going to put on Franklin is going to be significant. Okay. Uh, the cars that are currently going on Franklin was only, like I said, 20, 20 cars in 24-hour in period, one, one per hour-ish. Um, so even if they did, and it's a signalized intersection, so it's actually the perfect intersection to put some more cars on it where you do have a signal there to, to, to empty out. And I don't think that the parking on that street is that restrictive that it's going to impact the cars that are going to stack up on Franklin Street. Okay. So, so no, the traffic engineers didn't suggest any elimination of parking, but I can double check with them just to make okay. sure that, that that's still the case. What about retiming that light? Would that be a consideration there? Because they, they say they say that we don't need to. Right now, I mean, I mean, it's so short. It's you can get two or three cars before it turns. Yeah, and that's because it's usually only one or two cars there. Right? <laughs> There's usually not too many cars. Now, if you end up having three or four cars, then maybe I guess we can have to take a second look at that. But they, but what they're telling me so far is that we would not have to do anything <laughs> different with the timing. 
I mean, it's it, northbound on Franklin. You often have more than two or three cars stacked up. Yes. That can be yes. six, eight, ten yes. cars, right? Yeah. So uh, the northbound traffic there could certainly benefit from retiming that light. Uh, yes. I'm just not clear that the southbound would. But I mean, there's is there a reason to look at that? I can certainly mention that to them and see what they say. Um, it's not a bad idea. I don't know if they considered that because what we asked them to do is only look at what the changes to the one way would, imp how that would impact. So I'm not sure if, if they were saying, well, should we do something anyways? Basically what they're saying is by changing it one way, it's not enough of a change to that traffic signal to warrant any changes. But I guess it's a different question if we say, well, could we be retiming it anyways to make it better? that's a potential so I'll, I'll definitely run that up the ladder and see what they say okay well um, that light is also timed with every other light on route 30 yeah. the whole way out to us 15 so right. if you change lights there you're going to be into a big PennDOT study for right. every light from Buford Avenue the whole way out to us 15 mm -hmm. right <laughs> yeah that's a bit of a can of worms with that one. uh Appreciate so I, I see the, the pros and cons of all of these approaches here. It seems like the biggest problem we have is not necessarily the block between Franklin and Washington, but it's the block between Buford and Franklin. And in particular, it's the last, I don't know, 100 feet um, leading up to Franklin where it really chokes down to one lane. Um, Mr. Berger and I spent a few days one summer just kind of walk it up and down that alley looking at the bicycle traffic pedestrian traffic um, we both have ride our we ride our bicycles through there um, some of us might ride ride our illicit scooters through there um, and when you um, do encounter a vehicle you are frequently just pushed onto private property um, do we have any ability to widen the right of way there at that choke point there's that option. Um, I haven't approached, I, I was trying to get a meeting schedule with the, the Gettysburg College. There's actually two choke points, believe it or <coughs> not. There's the one that you talked yeah. about west of Franklin. Um, that property is owned by SPG Capital. Same folks, they, they have rental so properties. Changed all hands them. within the last yeah, few just years. Just recently. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're the same folks that we just worked with on South Street, and they were, they were great to work with. So uh, I think there's a potential. Uh, I think it would benefit regardless of what we do. To have some additional right of way there it's only 12 feet um, so i think we could do some better improvements if we had some additional right of way just east of the intersection of racehorse and franklin there's that the scale that's owned by the college believe it or not i mean it's a sea of pavement there so you don't feel that that squeeze that you feel west of the intersection but technically you're on private property if you're passing a car there on that scale yeah um, so i have a, a a meeting scheduled with uh, with um, Jim Bisacker at the college, and we're going to have some discussion on the potential of, of acquiring some right of way on that piece as well. So I think there there is a potential. We don't need it. We don't need the right of way to complete the project. Uh, we can complete it without it. Would it be better? Sure. And there's going to be some other things I'm going to show you in a little bit about if PennDOT would really push this contraflow lane cons component, then we would absolutely must have it. So that, uh, I'll come back to that. Well, I guess my next big question there is is creating a pedestrian thoroughfare there. Like, how do we do that if we don't have expanded right of way? I mean, if we're not putting in sidewalk, because we can't, because it's only 12 feet wide, then we're really telling any pedestrian, oh, by the way, you may have to go on private property. <coughs> and that's the use that we're sort of underwriting. Like, we're saying, yeah, just go ahead and go on private property if a car comes by. I, I, I don't know that we can do that. I think what we're, what we're suggesting is that it's a significant improvement to the current status. I'm not sure that you can, se that you can separate <coughs> that from the discussion. So right now, as it currently stands, there's a significant amount of pedestrians, significant amount of bikes, and a significant amount of cars. Mm -hmm. What we're suggesting here is that we want to try to reduce one of those components. Right. So no, there's no, still going to no. be a scenario. You, I mean, you're right. At the end of the day, there's going to be a scenario where if there's a car coming down the alley and there's also mom pushing her stroller, she's going to end up having to get off the edge of the alley a little bit. No right. different than going down a lot of uh, township roads. They're going to have to get off the edge of the road a little bit, and that's the way it's going to have to be. Mm -hmm. It's just what I'm suggesting is, again, that the, the discussion is that it would be a significant improvement if it's only 
one way or a funnel. Yeah, no, see what I, I mean. I, no, I, I totally get that point. Um, I'm just curious if if there's any capability for us to actually add a pedestrian thoroughfare. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't do we have the potential? Are we planning of on adding sidewalk on either side of the alley or no? No, no. There's no no plan for that. And again, this isn't something that we're designing from scratch. If we were designing from this from scratch, we would create this properly for the vehicles sure. and the pedestrians. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to retrofit an existing unsafe condition to make it better. Okay, thank you. Sure. I mean, John, do you want to speak to the amount of changes that have occurred in that alley over oh, 20 wow. or 30 years? I mean, Man. there have been a lot of poles moved, a lot of, I mean, there was a building moved um, at Washington Street. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's been a lot done to try to make that larger, but some places they hit the proverbial brick wall. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're what, 16 feet at Washington Street for right of way? No, it's actually 22, I think, at, wa at, at okay, Washington yeah, Street. Okay, yeah, because the college yeah. gave that mm -hmm. when that building... And it does have a sidewalk down. there. You're right. The college gave us, when they tore down the building, they gave us right away across there. So we were too wide. They wouldn't give us the scale. Right. So it goes, it goes down a little bit better than halfway, and then it kicks out for the old storage, right. ice storage property where the scale yeah. is. And then at that time... The house um, was owned by a guy by the name of Jack Harbaugh. He tried to sell the house to the borough so that we could get right away the rest of the way through there. Um, but, you know, he, he would have better luck with the lottery. He was a little high in his offering, we'll call it. <laughs> so we didn't do anything there. There's still an odd telephone pole there. Imagine that, Harry. We're talking about telephone company getting their damn poles. Uh, because there's an odd telephone pole there that, depending how you go through the alley, it gets hit on a regular basis. But then at the end of the Harbaugh property, here again, we gain property because uh, Wayne Hill and Gettysburg Construction owned that whole thing before it was Creekside Apartments. And they gave us right away. So the lower end where we redid the bridge is that's 18 feet? 18 on that side, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. we have 18 feet from the end of the Harbaugh property out to Buford Avenue. Right. So the choke point is the middle. It's, it's right off Franklin Street both ways. Yeah. And, you know, but I mean, we, we have had success moving electric poles in there when the alleys got widened and everything else. We just didn't have much luck with that one telephone company pole. And they won't go to the other side of the alley because then that puts their line too close to the house. So that's why it comes down and zigs over and does that number. So I mentioned the word contra flow lane earlier. Um, I don't want to get too stuck on this because I'm really hoping that we don't have to do this. Um, but we know that the vehicle code requires bicycle to follow the same rules as cars. So if you're going to sign this thing one way, one might question, does that mean bicycles can only go one way too? And that defeats the whole point of us doing this. Um, so what I the conclusion I came to so far with the, with the traffic engineers is that if you're designing this thing as a boulevard or a, um, a hometown, there's some catch words to where it is really intended to be primarily for pedestrians, then no, that's, that's not going to be an issue. Um, if you would still allow this bypass thing, Penn not might, might force the issue. Um, but if you did like the Franklin Funnel thing, there's a good chance that we can avoid any type of a contra flow lane. Uh, contra flow lane is kind of depicted here in this picture of the best. You can see all the cars going the one direction, so this is like a one-way alley going this way, and then the bikes would be able to go the other direction. If we had to incorporate something like that on the alley, it would be difficult. Like we're talking about, we only have 12 feet. So there's just not enough space for this contra flow lane to have these, and, and a contra flow lane can't go against cars without having a, ver, a, a vis visual separation. So there's about two feet in here with these, with these double yellow lines and these, these pedestals, <coughs> uh, not to mention the public works department wouldn't be able to go down that through there and plow it, because now you're, you're creating this little 
uh, it's, it had to be a minimum of five feet here, but that's all we could fit in there is five feet. So you can't fit a truck with a plow down there. Uh, and, then, and then you have those a bit vertical separation between the two lanes. So we're tr really trying to avoid this. Again, I don't want to get stuck on this. I just wanted to mention that, that, that if we don't make this restrictive enough to vehicles and we really are pro pro promoting a pedestrian thing here, um, this could come up if we end up having to go through a design review with PennDOT, which, by the way, we're not sure if we have to yet. It's a little side note. Uh, we did start to put together a matrix. This I felt confusing, so I don't want to get stuck on it. I want to come back to this in the future. Um, there's my contact information, and Todd Trouts was the um, traffic engineer for Michael Baker who helped me with this. Um, Charles, can you pull up the PDFs that I also sent you? I want to go through some of the, the slide that we looked at these different scenarios with one way west, one way east, talk through some of the pros and cons with each one of them, and, um, and they also had some contra flow lane components to them. So, so is Charles going to find that? Are you able to find that? That's not it. There's a PDF. It's not showing. There we go. There you go. So this slide here shows one way east and some of the signage and pavement marking. If it was one way east, we'd still have, and I know it's a little bit hard to see, but there's arrows right there that show um, two way into the Creekside apartments. We would still need to get a little bit of right of way from that, but essentially you wouldn't have to have any additional right of way um, for the one way east. The one area we're talking about where the restriction is. Um, that Mr. Moon brought up is right here. Um, this is where it goes from 18 feet down to 12 feet. Um, if it was one way east, you'd have do not enter signs here, you have a one way sign here, and you have do not enter signs over here. Um, another thing to point out is we still can fit um, the parking here. One of the things that doesn't show up on these slides is this project also includes um, redevelopment of the sidewalks on North Washington Street. We're looking to eliminate the parking on North Washington Street. There's currently five spaces there. We would be taking those five spaces and putting them here. There's, place, there's enough room here for four spaces. We would only essentially be losing one space if we were able to do that. Um, so the One Way East does allow for all of that. Some of the issues with this option is um, the pulling out at this intersection, the, the, the sight distance isn't great. Now, again, we're going to be bumping this curb and sidewalk out, doing some um, visual um, separations with the surface of the, the material surface. Um, so we're going to be definitely improving that, that, that sight distance, but it's still not great. Um, one way west wouldn't have as big of an issue there with that sight distance. Um, like I said earlier, one way east would allow for bypass traffic coming in this way and still continuing down uh, Racehorse Alley, this block. Um, but the, the, the traffic that currently comes down Railroad Street here, this is westbound. So they would no longer be able to um, bypass with this option. Go ahead to this next one. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You, you don't think, uh, having, I understand why you have the arrows both ways for the, the Creekside apartments, but do you think that would add confusion for like through motorists wondering like what this traffic so it wasn't necessarily with this way if you when we get to one way west that will be a concern okay that we if you do one way east so if somebody comes in here and they, they would be able to continue on through even okay. if they're not going to the creekside apartments um so there there would be a sign right here that says begin one way okay um and, and oh, okay, okay. See. There'll be a do not enter from the opposite side, right. keeping the cars from coming in. So this way doesn't really have any major okay. concerns. Um, okay. The only other thing that I was going to say with this one is, again, and I don't want to speak for the college. I still have to have a meeting with Jim B. Sacker, but I think that they come down and they turn they turn in here, and they're going to like that coming south and turning right, coming into their facility here. Uh, with this one that goes eastbound, they're going to have to come down through this traffic signal and then back up around to get to their facility. 
that's where we have a lot of stacking. So I think they're going to prefer just being able to come straight in right there off of that intersection. Um, so that is one of the other concerns with that. And it's the same thing too with the, the bank, it's right here. Uh, if somebody like is, is coming down Chambersburg Street, sees the bank, misses the entrance, there is an entrance there, but if they miss it and they try to turn and come in the backside, they won't be able to. And now they're going to have to go the whole way around to the square to be able to come back to, the, to get into the bank. Go ahead to the next one, Charles. This one here is just showing uh, with a contraflow lane. Again, I don't want to get stuck in the weeds with these contraflow lanes because I'm really hoping that we have to do it, but it does add a ton of, of confusion, especially if we, with no additional right away. If we don't get any additional right away, you got to add signage. Um, you can kind of see it's a yellow strip here where is the contraflow lane is shown here. You have to have signage here where it would stop. And then it would pick up again here after those, uh, those choke points if we don't get additional right of way. So go on to option three. Um, this is if we get the additional right of way, the contraflow lane obviously works better. Um, but again, it's not my favorite option. Uh, this is one way west. Now we're talking about going west, and you can see over here, we don't show that two way anymore going in and out of the Creekside Apartments. In talking to Todd, the traffic engineer, he said you could still do that. You would have to put signs out here that says um, no through traffic or one way ahead or something like that. So if somebody was entering in here to the Creekside Apartments and they didn't want to go there and they wanted to continue to head east, there would be a sign there that would basically stop them. So the no through traffic or one way ahead sign would try to preclude most people from having to do that. I find that to be a little bit confusing and most and this it's probably going to invite people to be having to turn around in their parking lot is what's going to happen. Um, but this option, one way west, does work better with, like I was saying, with a college trying to come in right here. Although There's I've seen a lot of the college's box trucks go down Franklin, because I ride my bicycle down there, and they go down Franklin and go to the Naus building. You okay, know. good. So uh, I've seen yeah. enough. One way out. Um, no, I've seen trucks coming, or coming in. in. Yeah, yeah, because that okay. that's a tough corner. That Washington and yes. Racehorse yep. Alley is a tough yep. corner to take yep. a truck in. Yep. So they I've seen them more go down Franklin Street and over yep. to the Nouse building that way. Would you try to take the scale you're talking about trying to take the scale out or No, so because I know we, that's no matter expense. what we do there, we want to make the alley surface flush we could take the scale off if we had to it's expensive uh, to do yeah that, that would be expensive expense, we don't really yeah. have that included right. in the budget i did email at jim right. that, that, that we would have to take a look at the budget see if we have enough money for that but we would always always want to keep it all flush the, the entire pavement there so the trucks could still make the turning movement we would never make a, a vertical curb to where the alley and all of the pavement at the scale was at a different level okay yeah it's been many years but when i worked that job we always went off washington street it's a fun thing to go off of on a bicycle to get off, off of that scale to get off of uh no but onto the into the alley oh yeah at the I college know. many many right. years ago yeah. um getting onto racehorse alley from franklin street without going onto someone else's right away is really going to be interesting right um and making a left from franklin street into there is it's doable but it's challenging in certain vehicles you went from Franklin Street, made a left into Racehorse Alley, going west. That's that'd be a tight. little tight. That'd be tight. There's a pole. So again, one one option we we talk about yeah. this the intersection right here at Washington Street and the queuing. Um, this out this option does allow that to empty, right? So there's kind of a, an exit lane. People can turn right there on to on to, um, to the alley to go westbound. Um, that would help the queuing a little bit with that intersection. Go ahead, Charles, on option five. Um, this one shows one way west with the contraflow lane. Again, I'm hoping to avoid a contraflow lane, but I'm showing that we could do a westbound with a contraflow lane the whole way through there. How would the contraflow lane with the um, <laughs> vertical markers work with all of those driveways? Not well. Not well at all. Yeah, no, granted, but like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, could we even place them at all? There's, there's more ways to do it than just with vertical vertical markers. There's mountable curbs. There's a lot of bad options. There's no good option that I know of for that contraflow. There's so many driveways there. Yes. It's the entire Our properties are very narrow. Yes. 
So go ahead to the next option, option six. Um, this is the Franklin funnel. Um, this would allow people to come in both ways. You could have the two-way traffic here at the Creekside Apartments, but the through traffic would have to come out Franklin. And then over here, if they were coming down this way, they would come in and come out Franklin. Now I could still envision um, cars coming and, and to avoid the stacking right here, um, making a right-hand turn here and then coming down and doing like a zigzag to bypass the Washington Street um, traffic signal. Uh, This one would, of course, would have do not enter signs at all four corners of the Franklin Street intersection to tell any of the cars that are coming up Franklin Street that they can't go on the racehorse alley. They would have to turn around and call to sack. The good thing with this is that we do have a call to sack here. So those people could just turn around and come back out. The other nice thing about this one is that you do have a traffic signal there, which is, um, according to the count that we showed, is underutilized currently so that's actually the one that can take the additional cars the best um, what time of year were those traffic counts done Do you know about a month ago so yes because I remember the 13 yeah. plan and one of the things I noticed was that the traffic counts were done approximately mid-December mm -hmm. I yeah, think so that you, the problems we're going to experience here are in July yeah so you get more of the college influence in this time of the year but you get less of the um, you get less of the um, tourist influence so we, we I remember thinking about that back in 2013 we had that same discussion of when to do the traffic study Andrew Merkel from County Planning was helping us with the traffic study and there was a suggestion that um, doing it while college is in session is a more of a realistic uh, analysis than tourists because the tourists we didn't anticipate use this as a bypass as much as the locals. It's more of the locals that know that they can bypass the traffic signal of that alley that, and specifically the locals that go to the college. The college, a lot of the college traffic comes in, goes right here to the college, and then they go out right here. Right, right. if I recall correctly, the date of the study was in mid to late December. Yes. And neither the tourists were present nor the college students. I think it was both. I think, I, no, I think they had it, did it during college season. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they were gone because finals are usually the first week. We'll have to I remember check noticing that, that I remember and thinking that how flawed that seemed to be. Yeah, I remember having that discussion with Andrew. I thought he did it while college was in session. Either way, I know this, this traffic study that was just done, that college was in session. They were back in from winter break because yes. they don't come in until yep. probably the last week of January, yep. which is just about a month ago. Right. So, and again, the Franklin funnel, one of the other things I want to point out is there's also the Franklin centrifuge thing where they can come up Franklin and then go out both ways and come up and go out both ways. So we, I, I feel like this option over the Franklin centrifuge um, has some advantages with the stacking of the vehicle at Washington Street intersection. I feel like it has the advantage of the college um, equipment coming in to to get into their their warehouse building um, I think it has the advantage of using this Franklin Street um, traffic signal and it still works with the Creekside apartments the centrifuge doesn't have those same components I believe that's it I think there was one other option six with the contra flow lane which again we're trying to avoid but I did show there that we could try to do the the um, contraflow lane with the Franklin funnel. So that's kind of where I stop. Again, if you guys want to have a more discussion tonight, we can. Certainly don't have to. No decisions need to be made today. You can take all this information, start to mule it over. Give me a shout if something pops into your mind. We did get one uh, bit of public comment already. Um, Ms. Sipperly did email me comments. Um, she had uh, some good thoughts about, uh, and generally speaking, the Franklin Funnel was the one that she was suggesting that was the best. Um, so she had some good ideas with that, but most of which I already captured here in the presentation tonight. Other than that, I haven't had any public comments about these uh, this one way. I do intend to meet with the college 
and I do intend to meet with SPG Capital and have all, also all, already reached out to um, the Creekside Apartments um, for some more information. That's still a variable on whether or not we can get those right-of-ways. We can get those right-of-ways, of course, that changes the way that we look at these things a little bit. Um, so that's what I mean, that there's still some more questions and there is answers at this point. So I don't anticipate us having a final decision here today, but um, certainly wanted to get the ball rolling with this discussion. Well, I'll, I'll speak up. Uh, for one, I, I think the funnel makes the most sense. Um, The concept of reducing the through traffic is, is absolutely key to creating a safe environment for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so, I, I mean, the funnel, I mean, you're only going to do it a couple times by accident and sit at that light at Franklin before you're like, screw this, I'm not going to drive down that road again. Um, you know, if we can really just encourage residents to use the alley there, I mean, that really is the the ideal goal uh, I, I will say that the the one thing that still does concern me about the plan is that um, intersection at Washington where cyclists will be needing to take a left against oncoming traffic with very limited sight lines uh, and, and I understand it'll be a little bit better if we lose those parking spaces and we have a little bit more um, <coughs> room to come to a stop and see the traffic in both directions but it, it, i still think it's going to be a really dangerous intersection for cyclists uh you're coming down a hill you can't nest if there is a, a a queue of cars waiting you know at the light you may not see uh northbound traffic as you're making that left um it's still pretty concerning i think yeah i think and i think that's a legitimate concern that mr moon's bring into our attention um, we have considered that with uh, I mentioned we're going to try to put some different textures in the pavement there to kind of separate whenever currently whenever you turn off of Washington Street onto the alley it's just all asphalt you're going from asphalt to asphalt and there's no like vertical separation we're looking to put a mountable curb along there so that whenever you turn in there you're gonna have to slow down um, we're also looking to um, bump that curb out it's going to be a taper across the face of that alley the parking spaces will be eliminated so the curb will come out further there won't be any parking so that'll help the site distance a little bit so there are some things that we can do to improve that condition but it's it's a tough spot I and mean, it's, a, it's a legitimate concern yeah what i understand you're saying is we don't do the the funnel option and we have it one way from buford to Washington either way it will only be one way for bikes because the counterflow you say is going to be very problematic would that be a fair so, statement yeah and, and this is where this is where we go back to earlier I mentioned that the if we go to the Franklin funnel we're fairly confident that it will be so re restrictive to cars that if bikes are flowing the opposite direction, it's not going to become an issue. This is something we're going to have to work with our police department on because ultimately they'll be the people that will be enforcing this. Um, but we've done um, some studies. It's mostly in Europe where they're a little bit more forward thinking in, in their bike traffic than we are here. Um, but they allow that kind of thing pretty frequently. One way streets and the bikes can go opposite of the one way. So that's what we're anticipating with the Franklin funnel, that the bikes would be able to just go the opposite direction. They would ignore the one-way sign. They would go any way they want to go, um, just like they kind of do already at all the rest of the alleys <coughs> in the one way currently. Um, our, we have a little bit that, that the concern for that starts to increase. And, there, and, and unfortunately, there's no like hard and fast numbers in, in the United States that says at this level of traffic, number of trips or at this speed now it's no longer safe for that there's nothing like that um, but obviously whenever you start doing the just one way all east or all west you're still going to have a significant amount of bypass traffic and higher speeds and everything with it um, so the, the the confidence level of making that safe against the one way um, starts to increase with the with the one way all west or one way all east um, 
I'm not saying at this point that that's going to be something where they wouldn't still allow it. Um, but I'm just saying that that confidence level decreases with that one. And then, of course, we're not even having this discussion if we don't make it one way at all. If we, if we, that the alley as it currently is, people can go both ways, bikes go both ways. They make it around by traveling on private property. We're trying, again, we're trying to improve that condition. Um, but there is still that on the table that you don't have to make this thing one way at all. We can still put bricks within a 12 foot wide alley and put some lights and move on with life. That is still a potential option. So are you saying that SVG owns just the property on the corner, or do they own multiple properties along that? No, they just own this property right here. So it, it look from the back, I mean, it looks like there's actually like eight to ten properties that abut that very narrow section. <coughs> Um, and the terrain there where we would be, you know, if, if there was a car in your way and you're on a bicycle or some other thing, I mean, the terrain is, is, is pretty rough. There's loose gravel, there's grass, there's buckled pavement. Um, Charles, can you go back to option six and then zoom into that intersection? Can, I mean, can this plan allow for paving, you know, an apron that um, kind of goes into these driveways a little <coughs> bit so that there is a safe surface for uh, bicycles to move on to. The way that the current design shown is, so, so what Matt's describing here, the, the north side of this, the property is, is long and rectangular like this. This is SPG's property. In fact, they own all of these, but these are also long like this oh okay i'm sorry i thought you were saying they own the one yeah no they own that this one fronts right on, here on, on north uh, chambersburg so if we were able to get a little bit more room from them on this north side that would be the only well there's it's also them up here on this top side but there's a driveway that comes in the back so there is a little piece right here we would have to get right away from that property and right. from this property both owned by spg capital the south side all of the properties have the same rear property line right so we won't need any more right of way from them and we're showing this trail basically right on that property line so any improvements we did south of that line is essentially on private property right there was some suggestions in the master plan that we try to change some of those surfaces the Landscape architects had these nice pretty renderings where they were turning it into grass and putting trees in and stuff, but it was blocking driveways. Right. It's just a, <laughs> I, I don't want to sugarcoat it too much because it's not a whole lot you can do there. Uh, there I think there is some room for improvement, but it's limited. As far as safety with bicycles too, I think isn't it the law that you have to have four feet between the car and a bicyclist? That's the, that you're supposed to, if you're yeah. passing a bike, you're supposed right. to give them four feet. So there could be signage on that alley as well for that too. I mean, I know Happy has encouraged those signs throughout the, the county really. So would this pavement be marked with sharrows? I mean, would this be a full right for bicycles to just be in the middle of the lane and bikes if, and cars would just kind of have to slow down and wait their turn? Yeah, so if we just did a shared lane like you're seeing here, um, there wouldn't be any sharrows marked on it. That what there would be would be um, signage placed that says share the road. And it would have those pictures of, of a bike, a pedestrian, and a car. And there would be a sign that says share the road, all three of them. We wouldn't necessarily have to put sharrows on something like this. And again, if we were creating this, what they, what they define as a boulevard or a town center, and, and again, what the goal would be is to, to have a speed limit that would be like 15 mile an hour and limited ADT. So you really aren't going down this alley unless you're getting to the back of your property. Got it. Ever, nobody else should be doing it. There should, if, if you went with this proper, with this option right here, this, the goal of this option would be that there's no bypass traffic, right? And it would be pretty safe to pedestrians in that case. Thank you. Any other thoughts? 
I guess at this juncture, does anyone have further questions to try to help inform what they're going to think about over the next month until we get back into this and start to discuss options? So I could probably go for quite a while with merits and detractions of some of these options, but I think this is kind of the stage that we're at. That, that's exactly right. To food for thought, start thinking about it. Um, and, I, and I'll follow your lead, President Heiser. If you want to have this back on the agenda next month, we can do that. We continue to have it on the agenda every month until we make a decision. Or if we feel like we need to skip a month, that's fine too. But just, that's what I'll, yeah, between Charles, myself, and Matt, we'll sit down and look at it and see if we have months that are busy <coughs> that are not as much and try to balance it out that way so we can efficiently use everyone's time. In the meantime, we'll have some meetings with the college, SPG Capital, and the Creekside Apartments and see if yep. they have any input that will help steer the discussion. Very good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That takes us on to the employee policy manual. So in 2009, almost a long time ago, <laughs> was the last time the, the borough did a comprehensive review of its employee policies manual. Um, now that we have a full-time HR coordinator on staff, we uh, have the ability now to revise this and, and refresh it to, frankly, meet the standards of the current world we live in because there's a lot of things that have evolved from an HR posture uh, since 2009 that are frankly not incorporated in, in the current draft. So Kara has spent uh, the better part of this year, or last year rather, uh, reviewing the current uh, policies, uh, tweaking the current policies, and adding new ones. Um, in the draft in front of you today, you'll see there's, I think, 33 chapters with different uh, headings. Uh, on those, and, and Kara can speak to how she developed uh, this document uh, in, a, in a, just a minute. Um, th it's a lengthy document. This will be a fairly lengthy process, so my intention would be to kind of take multiple chapters over the next four or five months. And, you know, it's been 2009, a few more months isn't really going to, <laughs> to matter too much. So we can methodically and deliberatively go through all of this. We'll also have to make sure that anything in here is cross-reference with our labor agreements with uh, the uniform and non-uniform. Um, so that is articulated in the body of this text as you get through it. Uh, so with that, I'll just stop and maybe Kara can talk about the, the things that you've done uh, with this and then I have a basic cool. question for the council after that. Uh, well, I mean, like he said, uh I have gone through for the better part of a year and just looked at it, saw what needed to be updated, some things that were um, frankly not necessary anymore, so I took some of those out of the handbook. Um, things that needed to be updated, anything like that, um, and then just some food for thoughts. Um, we thought maybe if you guys were interested, we could come up with a mission statement for the borough. I know uh, a lot of companies do it to construe what they want their workplace culture to be like, so we could also use it as a what we would like our borough culture and workplace culture to be. Um, just if you, you want to work towards that. Not every municipality has a mission statement, but some do. So uh, I articulated to you previously. It's the local government. Okay, I understand, but at the same time, you know. Mission, vision. A lot of cur currently, we don't have one. So I hope, I hope this would be, know what we're this be a good time to discuss I, it I if you'd like to. I think it's a good exercise, one. though. Having it a, can be. It's yeah, a, it, it can be. I mean, I, I think. I always find it humorous when people try to revise them several times in the course of 10 or 15 years, and I'm like, it really has not changed that dramatically. But it yeah. helps to put sometimes a focus, right? which I think is an important thing. So. Yeah, like I said, it's not quite necessary, but it would help and aid in um, letting people know what our workplace culture here at the borough is. It's great for advertising, too, when you, if you're advertising positions, you know. I actually have had somebody call and ask if we had a mission okay. statement <laughs> and where to okay. find it. And I was like, okay. oh. That's, that's actually why we're asking the question, because yes. someone actually came, came to us and asked that yeah. question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
And it was a little bit embarrassing. It's like, oh, we don't have one, you know, and they, when they, the assumption was we did. Okay. Okay. Um, but some of the newer things that I added um, were, like, Miss Miss Jewity really wanted to see a, a, a internet in kind of, like, update of the internet usage. I mean, it had a lot of things, I mean, from 2009 that... Yeah. Uh, we've, we've, we've made leaps and bounds since 2009, and there has been uh, social media that is now added um, that has made a big change in workplace uh, policies. So I've added that. I've added um, quarantine guidelines in the face of some questions that came up as far as COVID-19 and anything going forward with any other, hopefully no more pandemics. Um, but just in case, it is there. Uh, and then some other added things, so I don't know if anybody's read through it or has any questions for me for anything that maybe you believe that should be in there that maybe isn't, if I can look into adding them. It's probably a very good place to start. I mean, I think that if we're talking about a few months, it would probably be prudent to make sure that you reviewed in depth, I would say, perhaps for next month, the first six to eight chapters. So that, um, that I thought that would be good to do, it's about six chapters per month <coughs> until we're done. Yeah, I mean, because we may have to come back to things, but that's when I, you kind of naturally start at the beginning, but when I read it through in its entirety, right, that's my mind was heading towards, are there things that are missing? Are there things that seem to be absent? Um, but otherwise, it, it should be relatively linear. And, and I could see places where we could, uh, reorder. I don't, I I don't, know, I don't know the order of this makes th the best sense right now. There were some things that, yeah, uh, seemed there's to There's things that probably, a couple chapters probably could be combined into one. They didn't fit in the, so, some things that should have been split out. Yeah. So, I, I mean, them. those are the, the types of formatting things we need to look into as well. Mm -hmm. So you're saying if we do have comments on particular items, we should save them until we get to those chapters and not bring them up tonight would that be not be well, you could sir i think you'd certainly forward them to me so that i have them in in my head and written down so that when we get to those specific chapters we can start to address them speak to specifics yeah 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 i think what i want to make sure is just that when we if we're <coughs> going to deal with certain segments i want to make sure that everybody's read it to depth yep. and that they have you know understanding and feel comfortable with the outcome um, because there are a lot of things i would say linguistically in that time period right that have seen revision and how they're articulated in most workplaces. I, I would encourage you that as, as council is reviewing each of these chapters, you also cross-reference at the same time our labor agreements. So we, you all have copies of those. So um, because the labor agreements <coughs> will supersede this, but where the labor agreements are silent on an issue, this will supersede the labor agreement. So there's that symbiotic relationship between those various documents. And you'll, and you'll see locations where it refers to the collective bargain agreements. I think our, our goal with that is to avoid creating conflict unless right. it's absolutely necessary <coughs> or unforeseen because of some future alteration to a CBA. Correct. Mm -hmm. And there are places where the labor contracts are silent that we have in here. So. You'll want to read all three documents as you're reviewing this. Mm -hmm. And then going forward, the CBA is going to change every four, four years, years or so. at minimum, or well, at maximum, I guess. Um, but you'll also want to review your employee manual around the same time as well. Uh, realistically, they should be reviewed and updated every five years. In a while. So what will our how will what will our format be moving forward? Will we be reviewing these at every a, a chapter at every work session or probably how, probably, about probably two about six. Per be prepared meeting. with about six, I would say prepare yourself for eight chapters and we'll stop when it's prudent. Monthly, monthly. I think so until we're. Done. I mean, there's some things and I what every individual's experience has been in different employment scenarios can have a great impact. I learned a lot more than I ever wanted to know about FMLA at a certain point in my life. Yeah. And if you don't set policy, you're really allowing a lot of latitude. And you have the right to. So things like intermittent leave or not, and I saw that we do cover a lot of things within our current draft in terms of 
and the same thing with uh, remote work as mentioned, right? This isn't something people would have often thought about maybe five or ten years ago. Um, but because of the nature of the operation here, it's just not really conducive to remote work. And that's something that we are is articulated in that draft. And it's something I think that, you know, the employees deserve to have a, an awareness of, hey, this is how this would operate if you're a per prospective employee looking to, to join the organization. Right. Are there other um, good mission statements out there, Kara, from other municipalities that you'd recommend that we look at um, going back to the mission statement? I looked at a couple that were in the area and they just touched on what their core values were. Um, a lot of them rotated around whether or not if they were a historical community, <coughs> whether they valued uh, the upkeeping of their historical um, community and keeping that in there. Um, and a lot of them also did uh, alluded to like keeping up with their constituents and making sure that they prided themselves in their police departments upholding uh, accountability and everything like that so that there's a lot of things that we could add that would it's just a lot of the times they're very personalized to what you want your borough to be it seemed like so whatever you would like to see in your borough which I think is Gettysburg we pride ourselves a lot on our historical value um, so that would be one of them, but we also pride ourselves on making sure our community is safe and secure and that we follow ordinances and guidelines and everything like that. So we would have to really tailor our mission statement to our borough specifically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wes, may I yes, I'm time? sorry, yes. Um, Kara, thank you, thank you for the time you put into this. I know that the 2009 revisionists, there were three, and they worked a very long time, many, many, what many, in the room. months on that, <laughs> and, it, and it was just you, and yes, in the room is the leader of that group who worked very hard, but I'm also glad you pointed out things are changing so quickly, they did not have to consider the importance that the internet would play in employee activities, nor the social media. Mm -hmm. That just was something we hadn't come upon yet. And so I think your other point that we need to look at this more frequently because things are sliding along so quickly that we'll be faced with things we can't foresee right now. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I, I just think we need to look at the manual more frequently than we did this last time. But again, thank you for all this time that you put in on 85 pages of difficulty. So, thank you. Well, I, and I think this is one of the benefits that we identify when we're reorganization, reorganizing the uh, management and the staff was trying to create an HR position that did not also, Sarah was doing HR and about 20 other things. Right. Uh, <laughs> so that doesn't really give a lot of time to take this type of examination without having to send it out of the house and you know, have someone else take a look, have our own personal staff to be able to monitor that and you know apprise us as things come about, as I'm sort of sure they will. So logistically, um, referencing you know six or eight chapters against both contracts, <coughs> it, this is this will be time consuming. This is yeah. So can we assume that we will get monthly instruction from you? You know for the workshop, be prepared. I with. can do it that way. I think yeah, that that's fine. Ideal. I'll do that in writing because so, it's it's going to be one of the more important things that we'll do this year. Um, just because of the impacts that it can have, which can be quite broad. Yeah. <coughs> Great. So, so you'll give yeah. us like a monthly summary of what we need to work I'll on. I'll make a plan workshop. of sending that out. Yeah, I'll send that out tonight. <coughs> Thank you. Excellent. Tomorrow morning. Just also, uh, our intention would be so as we decide which chapters we're going to de deliberate in a specific meeting, we'll send that to Labor Council ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So we'll have those comments already at our disposal. That's excellent. Yep. Super. Yeah. Any questions about where we're headed with the employee manual? Thank you for your efforts right. on this. Oh. Got it. If you have any questions, just reach out to me and I can let you know. Or if you have any suggestions upon reading. Great. Yeah, I would say particularly if you have technical questions about what anything means or maybe what's uh, 
common practice within human resources, uh, I think that's where we're, where we're going to be leaning on CARA significantly. All right, that takes us to probably one of the, I don't think that's just this year. <laughs> Although I did, I did examine the, the schedule, which I thought was <coughs> appropriately aggressive, um, but certainly we know it's going to go into 2024 with the, the rezoning. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, today actually is pretty simple. One of the things that the council um, did allocate funding for a rezoning effort um, in this year's budget, and we are contracting with Michael Baker International, who we use for other planning um, purposes as well. Um, part of that project requires a steering committee um, that would be meeting um, for between six and eight months, and we hope to start in April. Um, and that would be probably that would be due to um, scheduling limitations that would be <coughs> during the day on a, a work week, um, once a month for about an hour and a half. Um, and I'm, we're sort of leaning towards the second week of the month so that we can have a meeting right before planning commission. So people who aren't able to um, attend daytime meetings, we, this will be a standing item on the planning commission's agenda. Um, and so what we are proposing as staff is that we have um, a committee of seven to nine people, which would include um, staff, myself, Chad Claybaugh, um, someone from Adams County Planning, possibly Main Street Gettysburg, um, and also a member of the building and design community, which we do have a volunteer um, for that, and then a couple of members of planning commission and at least one member of council so that we can make sure that what we're discussing in those committee meetings is in line with what council is looking for and we don't kind of create something that, that gets here and um, doesn't fly. So. Um, and then, like I said, we'll re we will report to planning commission every month, um, and and that feedback will go back and forth as well. Um, so what we are looking for right now are volunteers for people who are interested in serving on the committee. Again, we're thinking uh, three to four members of the public. Um, and I originally, when I prepared your packet, um, had said uh, applications by. Um, within the next two weeks for a March 13th appointment, but it actually, I forgot how much the short month impacts our meeting schedule, so it would have to be within the next week um, to make it for a March 13th appointment. So it might be more appropriate to ask for people to volunteer by Monday, April 1st, and aim for an April 8th appointment, which would still leave us time to meet in April. Um, and then it would still give, go ahead. Well, from a, for a committee, it, it, it does, this wouldn't require a resolution or any type of legal action. No. I, mean, I can appoint a committee at any time. Oh, so, it doesn't have to be at a business meeting? No. no. Oh, okay. No. So I don't think you need to kick it off until April. And, and right. very candidly, my only concerns right off the top are, I mean, we had your suggestions for the Planning Commission. Can Ms. Kipp and Mr. Redmond make the schedule you have in mind will be my concerns? Because yeah. I think that many of the individuals you identified in your documents for us, you know, in terms of the planning commission and the design side of things, to me are the very logical choices. These are the people that are in the community. They've been involved in our organizations and Gar or pardon me, in uh, Harb, in the planning commission. They know the the borough, and many of them are skilled professionals, which certainly helps. I have actually already reached out to them to bear to to get sort of a general idea of where everybody is available. So, okay. yeah, I'm confident that they would, we would be scheduling around that core group. Um, <coughs> and I'm confident that uh, probably the second week of the month would be, during the day would be um, good for everybody on that list. Okay. That's already there. Yeah, so um, I think from the public, we're, what we're gonna be looking for are those <coughs> um, residents and business owners and absolutely. trying to get a good handle. And, and I do think it's also important that we consider the various other uh, activities that we have ongoing within the borough uh, and make sure that we try to tie some people in uh, that are related to those particularly more you know people we've had working on neighborhoods like Baltimore Street right that we make sure that this is all uh, cohesive um, so from the council what I'll be looking for and this is something you can think over over the next several weeks uh, perhaps um, two weeks <laughs> perhaps yeah. um, but if this is something that you would like to do uh, it does um, 
really lend itself to, to someone who's available for that time period and can make that happen. Um, and there will be a lot of guidance, I'm sure, um, professionally uh, from Ms. Marshall, but Ms. Kipp's also a professional planner. And uh, this is not going to be necessarily a simple process. Um, and it sounds like Michael Baker is going to be quite helpful in making this, this work. Um, this is something where <laughs> we've been talking about it. It sounds like Resource Alley also. Um, <laughs> When I started attending meetings, probably three years before I ran, it was always, well, we can't make a zoning change because we're going to revise the zoning. And then at some point after I got on council, we just said, the heck with it. If someone has a complex problem, like Tom Knox, we're just going to fix it. Right. Okay, and it got to that point. So I'm glad that we're arriving uh, to the, the juncture where we'll finally start to actually proceed down the path of adjusting our zoning. Um, <coughs> there are options. So do we want to say uh, by Friday, March 17th, to have applications in if any member of the public is interested? And then that gives a couple of weeks and plenty of time to, to schedule and tape for an April meeting. That sounds good for, for you. And that'll give Yeah, and we don't, I mean, again, you don't need to, to wait until an April meeting to start acting. <laughs> President of Council. Can That's not necessary. When I, yeah, when I, I was referencing a committee meeting in April. Oh, So we yeah. can start meeting no, in April. you can April start to, to get a schedule on. together yeah. and... Um, I do think it's prudent. The 17th sounds good just because of the nature. It gives us a few weeks for this to circulate amongst the public. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to, to kind of evaluate if we're touching all parts of the community that we want to touch with this planning approach. Okay. Mrs. Butterfield. I have three questions for clarification as I'm thinking of folks who would enjoy this. Um, they could live outside the borough but have a business in the borough. Is that you're thinking that's actually under the purview of council so we don't have this isn't a, um, a well I mean unless Harry has a has any other thoughts but I, since this isn't an official board or commission I don't believe that they um, that we have any restrictions in terms of um, the composition of the committee although <coughs> obviously we would want to have a good number of residents and many um, time of day would be important and you're saying that you're looking toward daytime it would commitment yeah it would be between nine and three and um, finally is your preference not to be current members of an ABC um, not at all I like I said we uh, we have two we we're planning to have two planning commission members obviously uh, one to two council members and so and um, the uh, volunteer that we have now for the building and design professional is um, on a board and committee too so yeah I, I don't think we would be looking necessarily that someone would have to be outside of those entities I mean all the various you think about the uh, mainstream organization you think about um, obviously Jill will be involved but but there are also board members of that organization that may be valuable um, so I don't think that I would allow that to limit it uh, when we look at residency or not, you know, there's a certain um, need for business owner input that may cause us to go outside of residency. But that would be something that we'll have to evaluate. Is there someone available who is a resident and a business owner and would, you know, have a really the longevity to have a, a good view of how this would impact the community? We may or we may not. It just depends upon the circumstance. We'll have to look and see who's willing to serve, too. That's the other big part of it, right? Okay. All right. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. And please, I would encourage you, as Ms. Butterfield is indicating, she is doing to, if you know people that would be helpful, to ask them to, to contact Ms. Marshall, and we'll assemble a list of names and and review the merits and try to drill that down. Uh, so when we broached the subject about a month ago, we set a preliminary meeting for March the 2nd to meet, and I said that I would be the council member present for that. Um, I am happy to continue in that capacity with this. However, um, since this project is going to go into 2024, maybe a logistics thing we need to think about is I may not be reelected. So 
do we want to see if there's another person who is in the beginning of a term who would have that consistency into 2024 who'd be willing to take over? If not, um, I'm, I'm happy to continue doing this, but um, if there's anybody else who would like to take this on in my stead who will be here through 24, definitely um, please identify yourself and we can talk about it. Yeah, I'm I mean, looking at you, Ms. Lawson. Feel free to let me know, but I mean, that would literally disqualify half the council. So we're not going to do that. We're but not going to draw that kind have, of um, distinction. For consistency. Because we're using a consultant, there may be budgetary constraints in extending the steering committee meetings into 2024. We anticipate the discussion with councils and revision will go on that long, um, but we are looking at probably six to seven steering committee meetings. That's what we've budgeted for. Okay. So, unless, unless we want to allocate. Yeah you know, additional for additional meetings. But I, d I don't think the steering committee meetings will go into the into next year. Okay. okay. And your list says three or four residents, but if it turns up we only get two, that's not going to put a screeching hop to the production. No, not at all. Now, we'll make it work. Obviously, the hazard, I think many of you know, the hazard is how large the group gets. Right. That's the hazard that's yeah. difficult to avoid yeah. given yeah. the complexity of what's going to happen here. That can be difficult. <coughs> Any other uh, comments or questions about the rezoning committee and where that will be heading? All right, any other items that we need to discuss before we go to public comment? All right, if not, we'll go to public comment. I'd ask you that you uh, give your name, address, and limit yourself to five minutes. Okay. Seeing no public comment, we will adjourn to executive session.